Hi, everybody. This is Aaron Mesh with Willamette Week. Uh, I'm speaking today with Dr. Esther Chu from Oregon Health and Sciences University uh, up on Pill Hill. Uh, Dr. Chu is an emergency room physician and also teaches emergency medicine at OHSU. Uh, lately, sh she's probably better known for being uh, among the most vocal medical observers, publicly at least, of President Donald Trump's condition as uh, both uh, leader of the free world and uh, America's most famous COVID patient. Uh, also perhaps its uh, most irascible. Uh, so Dr. Chu, thank you so much for finding time with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I, you know, I'm used to reading while I'm at week and so it's kind of thrilling to be part of um, such an important local resource. We're thrilled to have you here. The president says that he has no symptoms left and he's doing great. He went back to the White House today. He is working uh, in the executive quarters, not in the Oval Office, although apparently he tried. Um, is he better? Well, uh, so first of all, I'll preface this by saying this is my personal perspectives um, and I don't represent OHSU uh, in my assessment or opinions here. Um, so I think really hard to say whether um, President Trump is better or not for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that we're only getting partial information. Um, so we heard that his vital signs were stable. We heard a range for his oxygen saturations, but we didn't hear whether that's on supplemental oxygen um, or whether that was, um, you know, or whether that was with some supplementation, uh, meaning that he dips lower at different times. And, um, and we didn't hear the full set of vital signs. Um, and we heard that he feels great, but we didn't hear specifically what symptoms he does not have, you know, has a shortness of breath completely resolved, um, has his fever completely resolved, um, and what is his, um, uh, you know, uh, what are the details of his clinical status. Um, the other reason we really, really don't know how he's doing is because it's still really early in the course. I mean, the, one of the classic patterns that has emerged uh, in COVID-19 is that you can feel pretty good or just kind of feel like you have a cough or a, a regular flu early on. Um, and then uh, some patients will go on to get precipitously worse between days seven and 10. So those of us who have been treating COVID patients and, and really following the literature on the course of this disease are just kind of sitting back and waiting to see what happens as we get into week two. He's also had steroids, if I understand correctly. Mm -hmm. What are the usual effects of uh, steroids administered to a, a COVID patient or someone else experiencing a respiratory disease? Yeah, I mean, uh, steroids have good effects and they have negative effects. So the good effects, the reason that we give them are because they can modulate inflammation. And um, part of uh, the really damaging effects of COVID have been not just the virus itself, but the body's immune response. So we tend to have this really vigorous immune response and that causes damage to the lungs. So the steroid um, course is intended to interrupt that immune response and, um, uh, and of course, steroids of all kind come with side effects. Um, they can really affect your mood. Um, you can feel manic or super um, hyperactive. Um, it, it also can actually change your mental status and make you psychotic. Um, so, um, so steroids have a you know a host of effects, and um, uh, and so you know generally when you have a hospitalized patient who's ill, who's on a number of medications, and you're adding steroids to the mix, it's just something that you. Um, prepare for. You know that that can lead to um, to some behavioral changes, and uh, and the staff are always on the the lookout for those. I can see the downside of having a psychotic president. There might be a downside since they're in charge of a lot of things. What's your uh, what's your assessment so far grade for his doctors? Okay, so I mean, there's kind of two possibilities um, because what the doctors have described um, compared to the treatment that he's on has been very inconsistent. I, I mean, from the beginning, they've been saying he's totally fine, he feels great, he's high energy, 
um, nothing to worry about. And then he's on this, and then he went on this kind of escalating, very um, aggressive treatment plan that you would normally only give to a patient who has moderate to severe COVID. So there was this disconnect between the overall messaging and the treatment plan they were talking about. And, and there was this evasiveness about the details. Like, you know, they, it took a while to find out that he'd had a chest X-ray and that was abnormal. We haven't heard about a CT scan. Um, they were really reluctant to talk about um, you know, when exactly he was diagnosed and when certain therapies started. And so, um, you know, I think the possibilities are um, they're giving him treatment that is not standard of care, or they're giving him standard of care treatment. And he, um, he in their assessment at the bedside was that he was sicker than they were willing to let on. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons why they might give incomplete or, or you know, misleading information. And that, that may have been their you know, there's certain parameters around what they are permitted to say. Um, they're being uh, given certain direction from the White House, um, whether from the communications director or from the president himself. Um, but it's clear that they weren't giving a very lucid or consistent story. Are there risks or worries that you have associated with, uh, for lack of a better term, armchair diagnosing the president of the United States? Yeah, I think, you know, that's one of the um, the reasons I wanted to sort of make the caveat up front that um, these are just kind of my opinions. I think um, many of us in the medical field kind of stepped up to try to fill in the blanks and, and explain what's going on because it was so puzzling. And I think... Um, I think there's such a desire right now for accurate information and also for a translation of some of the science. You know, what is remdesivir? What are steroids? You know, what should we understand about um, the dangers of a huge White House outbreak like that? I think some of those things are, um, we certainly try to steer clear of armchair diagnoses, but rather give people an idea of the spectrum of possibilities when somebody has COVID. Um, some of those um, possibilities cross over into things that have really um, uh, relevance to all of us and to national security. And, and I think it's important to create some sort of framework so that it's not a bunch of, um, you know, uh, non-medical voices trying to sort through all the information that was coming from the medical team at the White House, particularly when that, um, that information I don't know what it looked like to a lay provider because I can't disconnect from my own brain. But um, you know, uh, from a medical perspective, it was so very confusing. Um, and I think there was, uh, you know, a lot of us kind of felt the need to step up and explain what was so confusing about it. So hopefully, we played more of a translation role rather than an absolute diagnosis role. Shifting slightly, the the president's approach to being a patient probably leaves something to be desired. Uh, what kind of model do you think he's setting for the rest of the country right now? Yeah, and this is where I would switch over to my public health hat. You know, there is the part of me that's like, uh, where is he in his clinical course? You know, how does he compare to other COVID patients? But, um, you know, I think a more important role for those of us in healthcare and involved in public health messaging has been what are the walkaways when you as a citizen watch what the president is doing um, and we also think, um, you know, how does it impact the messages, the very simple, straightforward and scientifically based messages that we've been working so hard to get out that will save lives, you know? I mean, what do people think when um, the president, um, you know, during his hospitalization takes a joyride around the hospital, um, putting the people in the car at direct risk? Um, what does it say when he comes out of the hospital with active COVID? like actively infectious. And the first thing he does at the steps of that, you know, that White House terrace is rip off his mask and then allow a number of photographers to come very close to him um, with a simple masks on. Um, and what does it um, mean for millions of lives out there when he says it's not a big deal, um, don't let it dominate your life. Um, and of course that's open to interpretation, but I, I think we could argue that COVID has really shaped our lives in terms of how we behave um, and, um, and little modifications to our lives that we've made in order to reduce the risk of transmitting the disease. All those things are, are so important um, so that we can get on top of this pandemic in the United States and get our lives back. Um, and so I think, you know, he's the most influential health messenger 
in the country, um, one of the most influential in the entire world. And his verbal and nonverbal signals matter so much right now. And so seeing all those things, I felt very discouraged um, because all of us working together collectively, I mean, those of us in healthcare, epidemiologists, virologists, public health, advocates, um, physicians, nurses, um, contact tracers, um, departments of public health, we've all been working so hard to try to get these simple messages out there. He's so influential, he can destroy that work in, in a moment or two. I'm sorry about the background noise. No, it's fine. Um, how much damage do you think he's done this week to that public health messaging? We'll never be able to quantify it exactly, but I think I, I think it's um, it will lead to illness and death. Um, I'm certain of it. Uh, again, because he has outside importance. Um, when Trump says anything, whether it's about a medication or a behavior, um, you can see that ripple effect culturally uh, of other people emulating that behavior. Um, you know, when he advocates for, hydro for hydroxychloroquine, it flies off the shelves, um, actually depriving people who need it for evidence-based indications. He is a powerful influencer of behavior around COVID. It, it cannot be underestimated. He has an immediate and powerful effect. I mean, when he talked about bleach, there was almost immediately uh, an attempted bleach ingestion um, to, uh, to protect against COVID um, that led to, you know, that, that had really devastating consequences. And so um, I don't know, um, I think really like smart uh, public health um, research people are probably trying to figure out like the impact of these bombshell messages on actual behavior and possibly even health outcomes. But um, I don't know that we'll ever adequately capture it. But I will say um, he's uh, one of the things about Trump is actually what an effective uh, viral <laughs> to use a pun uh, d deliberately. He really is a viral communicator. Um, and it's just ironic how he's become so viral around this virus. Um, and, and I think it has profound impact on, on behaviors, on safety behaviors. This next question is a dangerous one. Let's do it. Let's let's be dangerous. Life is short. Exactly. Speaking of which, if he dies, what does that do for public health? Oh boy, um, I've been afraid to go there mentally, um, frankly, because um, it's just you know. I mean, my medical hat aside, it is so destabilizing for our country to to have something like that happen. Um, and I think uh, you know. Uh, uh, I, I think that would be a real come to Jesus moment for people about the the impact of this virus and um, and how it does not see status. Um, it you know the the virus does not care who is influential um, and um, and I feel like that would be a really sobering moment for people who have been inclined to downplay the impact of the disease um, because you know whether we like it or not nameless, faceless, 210,000 people dying. Um, to many Americans who haven't been touched directly by this, um, have, uh, you know, that, that may actually weigh less than having this one person who has such outsized importance one way or the other, um, uh, you know, succumbing to this disease. But um, I mean, I, I think the president, despite having multiple risk factors has gotten uh, really aggressive world-class treatment is being monitored from minute to minute. Um, I think statistically speaking, he's still most likely to survive and do well.